Uh, my name is Dr. Njegi Karwe, uh, Department of Education Management and Curriculum Studies uh, School of Education. Um, our topic today is taken from um, the many topics of uh, we've been going through since the beginning of term, and it is methodologies in education planning. In this, in this uh, item, we will be looking at three, four, three subtopics uh, from the main topic, which will be to define the meaning of the meaning of the term social demand approach to education planning. Two, we should be explaining how the social demand for education is applied to education planning and how useful it is. Three, we'll define and explain how useful manpower approach is to education planning. And four, we'll define and explain how the cost-benefit analysis approach is applied to education planning. We'll begin right away with social demand approach, approaches to education planning. And we want, first of all, to understand what social demand approach is. Basically, the, the, social demand for, the social demand approach for education is defined as the popular demand of education. It views education as a consumption, and that education should be provided to all those who need it. What are we saying here? Seeing education as a consumption means we require to have the ability to do whatever, whatever we are as individuals and for the good of the country. And that the government must provide those who require education um, without any discrimination. It considers the following. Um, how many children are born each year? How many children are school age group? How many children of the school age group desire education? And that we don't provide education just for the heck of it, for the fun of it. We must give education to those who need that education. Why do we consider the number of children born every uh, born each year this enables us to know or to have the data of the numbers of children we will be um, planning for in the years ahead um, why do we require to know how many children are school age group that we must know which children what number of children are going to class one for example going to class two and beyond and so that um, uh, the government or even individual societies are able to, um, to plan for their requirements when that time comes. Um, how many children of school age group desire education? Like we said earlier on, we may not give everybody an education. It is at this point where we all must be aware of the exact numbers that we will provide for uh, for the particular time, for the particular age group, and for particular levels of um, education, so that um, we don't waste our meager resources on people who may not require education. Um, and this is what we're saying. We are saying that um, we should not provide education indiscriminately. We must give it to those people who desire it. We have, for example, in, this, in our country, we have uh, communities that don't even want to hear anything about education. They, 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 they're more concerned about other things, um, like, for example, in parts of West Pocot, Nandi, and all those areas. We have um, fellows who are, who, who are more professional in uh, cattle wrestling than the need uh, to do education. That's why it's important that we give education to those who, to those who deserve. Now, we will look at the advantages of this approach. 
Um, this make, marks the starting point in planning education for the future. It ensures that the education plans are put in place for the whole society, not just for individuals. It enables the planners to know what resources are required at each level of education. A simple explanation on this will be like, the, like as follows. Why do we call it a starting point? This is where we, 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 we take off. And so that we know that every plan we've done um, for either individuals or the, or the society are properly um, approached, I mean, we, they're properly um, uh, followed to ensure the programs um, will not fail. It also enables planners to allocate each um, level of education with the amount of finances they require. Those in secondary school may require less than those in primary school and or in tertiary institutions. It is at this point that um, um, we want to know which area we finance um, more than the other. Considering the fact that uh, um, uh, the, the resources are not enough for each one and every level of education, and also they are not enough to allocate to other sectors of the society, it therefore becomes important that we must know exactly and be able to follow those plans without um, problems. Um, we proceed to look at the disadvantages of this approach. One, this approach ignores the larger problem of national allocation of resources. What we mean by this? That the government has a lot of many other things to do. We have uh, other departments in the country. We have agriculture, we have um, <clears throat> we have agriculture, we have health, we have uh, general infrastructure, and therefore as we, as we, as, as we uh, plan, um, this particular uh, approach ignores the larger problem of allocation of national, uh, of, uh, uh, national resources. Um, it does not consider the education, the cost of providing the education is not considered. What we mean by this? that um, it looks at education in a manner that um, uh, it's like the be-all and the end-all. So at this point, um, it just provides finances with, I mean, regardless of other areas of concern in our uh, national development. It does not consider the employment sector. It doesn't care. It means it doesn't care um, uh, that, that um, the, the people out there with or without jobs. The concern is basically on the, the students in the society and generally how much it will require. Um, this approach also leads to extensive construction of schools and large enrollments resulting in low standards of education. This means basically that uh, because the money is provided out there, government puts up uh, institutions of learning without a consideration, for example, of how many people will come to school, how many will not come, how many will be taken in, and all. At the end of the day, you find classes that are supposed to have like 40 children or 40 students are overwhelmingly, um, overwhelming in numbers. And it becomes difficult for the teachers, even for the students, um, to, 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 to grasp, uh, to, 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 um, to understand faster, to learn faster, and more usefully so, to come out as intended uh, by the educational planners. We have several examples of such, um, such uh, problems in the country right away. We want to think about the 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 the, the TVET, the um, uh, other expansive uh, school uh, um, building of schools and institutions in this country, and where 
the standards have gone so low that um, we require maybe to revisit uh, the, 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 the need to build the schools and other institutions via learning or even other institutions um, without considering um, uh, the, 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 the results, the end, the, the end results which we must be concerned about. And because it beats, it beats reason that we have students in a school or in a college, wherever they will be, including at, at the university, uh, where because of numbers, lecturers and other uh, knowledge givers are not able to um, keep standards as required um, uh, by education, as required by education planners. Um, the second item we're going to uh, discuss today is the manpower approach to education planning. What's manpower? Manpower means those who are trained and have special skills um, that can be applied in the sectors of their requirements. So this, this involves, manpower approach involves analyzing or doing an analysis of the market needs of a country in terms of human resources, both in the past, present, and in the future. What are we talking about here? We are thinking, for example, um, let's look at our country, for example, at independence. At independence, our country had of officers working in the in, in our education sector and in many other sectors from our colonial from our colonial uh, master in this case uh, the British government and come independence and when these fellows left uh, the country was left in a state of of lacking that um, in many offices you find we found there were there were very few or there were no officers manning this office after the, uh, after the Europeans uh, left. There was therefore need for the government to look at that past and wonder what to require today um, and in, in, in the future. Hence the need to train um, an informed manpower uh, that, will, uh, that would at that time uh, taken over our, our administration, our offices, and uh, name it. Um, the manpower approach also is, import, is an important factor in sparring economic uh, growth, economic development. And because an educated manpower, a nation with an educated people, is able to do, um, to, 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 to work in their departments, to work in all areas of uh, economic growth and development, um, and because there are, there is, or tra there is trained personnel. So manpower approach is a critical, um, is, is, is a critical point in uh, enabling the country to grow, um, uh, both um, to grow, to grow and develop uh, at the same time. You, will, you can comfortably take an example of um, um, our East African countries. Um, today, and even in the past, Kenya, I think, took, took, the, best, took the best part of the British planning in East Africa. And therefore, tonight, as we speak, today, as we speak here, uh, Kenya is more advanced, both economically and um, uh, both economically and in educationally than most of the East African countries. At this point, um, you can look at the economies of Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda, and we are far, far away ahead of those others. Manipur approach also considers Manipur requirements for economic growth and regulated tra training in all sectors. E.g., how many people do we require in medicine? How many teachers do we require? in our learning institutions. How many people do require in, um, in, um, 
the veterinary services, you know, whatever, whatever. All those areas uh, of, uh, of growth requires a people that are trained, have the correct skills, and this comes from um, the approach that is an approach that uh, ensures the country is provided with skilled uh, labor. What are the advantages of this approach? Um, there are two or three advantages of um, a Manbo approach to development, and they include um, that it highlights the gaps between the graduates and the job vacancies and seek to fill those gaps. Today, we have a problem in our, in our medical services that we don't have doc enough doctors, we don't have enough nurses. We actually lack in quite many sectors. And therefore, this approach will, en will ensure us to, um, to, to allocate, to bring out from our institutions of learning the people who can fit in those uh, gaps. It's important to, 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 to remember, for example, uh, before independence, the country trained the number of people it required in every area. For example, if it was law, if it was education, if it was the, the, the medical sector, the government provided funds for only those, for only the numbers they required. Today, we're producing en mass, and at the end of the day, we are creating an employment in the country. You, you can look at the number of teachers who are lying out there, graduates, and uh, without a job. These are the kind of things we, we consider uh, when we use this approach. Um, it also guides on how the education system should evolve to meet manpower needs. I think that's already ex like explained. And manpower approach also ensures um, uh, the nation is, is properly supplied. It has the kind of uh, or professionals, it requires in all areas. Um, Manimo approach is also holistic in nature because it projects the requirements of the whole nation, which also guides micro planning. Next, we want to look at the disadvantages. The disadvantages of this approach, and um, they are as follows. First, the Manbo approach is a very difficult exercise because, because of many factors that go with, with, the, with the whole exercise. Um, so that more often than not, the planners will rely on uh, guesswork that um, we, we, we are sure it's going to be this. We're going to have so many children requiring to go to, uh, to, go, to, go to next class or to university. This this, this, this derails, uh, derails progression and, and because of the fact that um, maybe, when, um, maybe when we were planning, we did not consider uh, such factors, maybe even climate, uh, disasters, and all. And so that we end up um, make, doing guesswork as what is really going to happen uh, in the nearest in, in the nearest the future, it also focuses on high and low level manpower requirements, and as a result, there are some skilled and skilled workers um, who form the bulk of the working population are not considered. This um, is a drawback. It's a drawback on education planners, so that um, they find themselves unable to uh, to to achieve the expectations and because of that little bit. It's also, dis, it's also difficult to project correctly and because of uh, factors of sociopolitical, uh, technological and economic uh, changes in the labor market. What are we saying here? That there are changes that take place, like for example what's happening tonight, uh, we, we, we are talking about uh, the virus. This virus has destabilized all sectors of, of economy. The whole world is like bleeding from the same. And it's because of these uh, changes that, are, that uh, come 
um, that become a an disadvantage to the, the, um, the planner. And so that um, we, we, we require to look out for other ways that will ensure that we um, are able to satisfy uh, the needs. Now, the cost involved in finance, uh, to finance the demand for need is also not considered. They, 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 they cut across board. They look at, um, they, 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 they really don't care how much money the country uh, has to share out to other departments, to other areas of economic growth and development. They, they, they are kind of selfish to the extent that um, they just roll out. They roll out plans, they roll out um, the requirements, and without considering uh, the bigger, the bigger uh, item of uh, financing and resources. Um, and finally, the cost-benefit analysis and a rate of return analysis. In other words, the benefits. In this, this aspect of man, uh, this aspect of education, uh, of economic planning in education that uh, that fall with it, that it considers costs and profits, cost-benefit analysis. You are analyzing, for example, an investment and what you expect to reap out of that in investment uh, with time. Why, for example, are we paying fees to be in school? We're looking at we're looking at um, uh, profits in the, in the future. We, we want to become more informed and so that we can participate in the country's economic growth. We can uh, participate in uh, elections. We can participate in um, uh, the general growth of, uh, of the nation. And it, it, it's therefore an important aspect of um, education planning and because it is from this planning that we'll be able to produce the kind of person who will um, fill up those uh, areas. And, those, uh, and um, um, what is it that they, they, they expect at the end of, for example, paying fees for four years in secondary school, some other four at university, and even post-education. Uh, post Sorry. Um, because benefit analysis also considers current costs and future benefits um, for investing in education. You know, people today, people don't just pay fees. They, they pay fees because they expect that when, for example, I've graduated with a first degree or a second degree, I'll become a better earner, I'll be more knowledgeable, I'll be able to do lots of other things, lots of other things, um, uh, for, 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 for as an individual and for the good of the nation. Um, this analysis is also rational. Rational in the sense um, it, considers, it considers all sectors. Everybody gets their, 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 their cut. Um, and, like, and it also considers all levels of education. It's not, it's not constrained to one area. It looks at, it looks at our uh, primary school level, our secondary school, um, uh, the tertiary institutions, and sometimes even the, um, the universities. At one point, the 8 for 4 system was seen to fail or to succeed just because they did not do enough research um, on its expectations. In the beginning, it was like uh, it's technologically based, but then government did not do enough research to ensure that um, uh, the, the provisions of the requirements for the, eight, for the success of the eight four system um, uh, was taken into consideration. And finally, we'll be looking at the advantages and the disadvantages of um, cost benefit analysis of education and its returns. Advantages are like that one, it provides a link between education and the labor market um, by allocating more resources on, ma on manpower growth. Two, it gives profitability to education. And so that um, 
you use the student, you the, 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 um, the recipient of this education can say, well, I went to school, these are the benefits of my going to school, and or such other achievements. And finally, on the advantages, it guides formulation of policies which will enhance profitability. In other words, a government is able to, to look, the planners are able to um, put in place um, such areas as will enable the individual and the nation to, um, to profit, to benefit at the end of the day. Then disadvantages, even as we have the advantages, it's concentration on earning differentials as the assessment on profitability and on investment. What do we mean here? Um, it, 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 it concentrates uh, too much on, for example, if I drop out in class eight, what, shall I, what kind of person shall I be? If I manage to go through high school, um, and on and on. And also, it ignores the socioeconomic background of the individuals, which means that um, cost-benefit analysis doesn't take into consideration the fact that um, we are not all equal, uh, that we are not all equal, and therefore um, it becomes a, dis a disadvantage uh, when applied to uh, economics of education in planning. And final, final disadvantage will be that uh, it does not consider individual benefits uh, at the end of the day. It, th it therefore cannot be quantified monetarily. It means you can't say because of this, this is what you're going to be, this is what you're going to have. And you can see this, you can see a lot of disparities in, uh, in, um, in our graduates and, and, and because they just came out, yeah, um, some, some who are probably connected may end up getting um, a job even before um, those who passed better than they did. So it's, it's, it's a, it becomes a big disadvantage. And as we close, we want to say this, that uh, over the last 10 weeks or so, um, we've, done, we've done everything that was required in this unit. And my, 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 my prayer to you all is that uh, you make sure as we go towards exams, you, you do your revision uh, correctly, do a timetable that will enable you, um, feed on every topic before you go to the exams. And finally, um, our today's lecture, our today's discourse um, is the last of, is, is, is the last in this unit. And I can only wish you best as we go into the exams. Thank you so much. God bless. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.